Strong pick ban, strong team fighting, but sometimes they waver in the laning phase. So it's going to be really interesting to watch all stages of this game. And that's actually a really great point that you put out there. Texas A&M, I believe in their interview, they mentioned that their early game, their laning phase, was what they were specifically preparing for mm -hmm. against UBC. They feel confident in their, in their late game. They've got a strong pick ban phase, and that's what we're seeing right now. We've already soared through the bands, and instant lock Gragas for Texas A&M. And Texas A&M are probably going to pull this almost every game. They get to stay on blue side all three games due to the fact that UBC selected red for their side choices. So this first pick, Gragas, is a flex pick. It can go to support. We have seen Forgive Me, I Suck on that one. And we've also seen Picarus on it. So that's a high priority champion. Sejuani also off the table, but proof, he gets his Rek'Sai and they take the Nautilus away. Yeah, that Rek'Sai is very scary from Proof of Payment. DJJ also locking in the Nautilus as well. With Rek'Sai already locked in, though, something's telling me that's not going to be a jungle Nautilus. <laughs> yeah, the Rek'Sai is pretty much a dead giveaway. I was watching Remy, he's actually practicing this Nautilus because it is a flex pick as well that Tamu could pick up and then be like, you don't know where Gragas is going, you don't know where Nautilus is going because they're interchangeable in their positions. So this actually takes away a little bit of Tamu's versatility in their champion select. The Rek'Sai for proof, though, he in the last few games that we've seen him in Collegiate LOL, he's had Rek'Sai and Nidalee banned against him every game. Nidalee's up, but he goes with Rek'Sai, so he's not looking for those early picks. He's looking for a little bit of team fighting late with some aggression. Yeah, and I, I really love what both of these teams are doing right now. We mentioned that Tamu strong with their pick ban phase. UBC, it was their weak part, but seeing how quickly they're locking in, how confidently they're picking in these champions. It seems like both of these teams have got a plan going into this. And we can see Picker is heavily in conversation with the rest of his team. He's in charge of picks and bans. He sets it up for them. He does all the work for it. And they have so much faith in him in their late game shot calling as well. He calls tar targets during team fights. And he just has such a leadership role on this team. A great influence on them as well. But I want to talk about the champions that we saw yeah. banned. They hate playing against LeBlanc on Tamu. They've just flat out said they do not like playing against any LeBlanc player, and Bob Chin's a LeBlanc player. So they ban that away from him. They pick up the Orianna, but Epic Shot said he was looking forward to playing Assassins. So as this series develops, I don't know if he's ever going to be able to play it, though, because he never gets red side counterpick. So he's probably going to go for the Orianna every time, and they also lock in the Diana. That's a top Diana here for Epic Links. Yeah, this is a really flexible composition from AMU, and this is something you and I were talking about before the game. UBC with red side all three games, yeah. that leaves Bob Chin free to counterpick every single time. And sometimes this has helped UBC, but it has also hindered them in some of their past games. So when you have counterpick, you still have to have a large enough champion pool that you're adept at that you want to bring out on the live stage to actually counterpick with. If he's just got Zed in his back pocket against Orianna, then he's going to pull that out. It's not going to synergize with the comp too well, but they will become a skirmish pick comp. But if that is an Urgot that he's picked up, that's a pretty good matchup, and Urgot just gets to farm. He gets Ooh. to scale in the late game. And another assassin here. Yeah. Bob Chin looking to show off on his first game on the big stage as he picks up Katarina. And with that, we've got our two compositions locked in. Texas A&M looking very strong with a standard team fight composition. Could we have expected anything less from the team well, fight I team? Well, I don't know how standard Diana Top is. It might be standard oh, for yeah. Epic Links, but he gets to get the ball in. He is the point-and-click ball delivery system, and if they have this synergy between Epic Shots and Epic Links, then they're going to be able to pull off some crazy moves in the late game. Good team fighting, good ability to actually disengage a fight and then pick the one that they want. UBC, though, they have a lot of go buttons. They have the, the Scion ultimate. They can get a Rek'Sai with a flank. Bob Chin, he's going to have to wait for people to get poked down by Urgot, by Heat Waves, before he gets into the fight. And here's the thing, is this bottom lane, Urgot Nautilus is something that we actually saw in Korea a whole bunch. We saw it in the North American playoffs. It's a very oppressive bottom lane. If Nautilus lands any ability, Urgot's follow-up chunks him out, and you basically win the lane off of one misposition. Yeah, and so Bob Chin is going to be the big playmaker for his team. We saw his play on Zed during the uh, qualifiers getting into this. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are now loading onto the Rift. This is Texas's A&M University taking on University of British Columbia. In game number one of the NICC 2015 semifinals, we have now loaded onto the rift. Let's see. I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to the team fights in these yeah. games. Laning phase, all right. Maybe UBC will come out with advantage. Maybe Tamil will surprise us with some early roams. But I'm looking for the lane swaps. I'm looking for the team fight shot calling in this matchup. Yeah, that's one of the big exciting points 
is that UBC are all very highly mechanically skilled players. They're very confident in their lanes. Bob Chin frequently solo kills his opponents. DJJ, very aggressive in the top lane. He's typically the first to receive pressure from Proof. And oh, Bob Chin sees a five-man invade going on, but he's just going to drop a ward and uh-oh. Yeah, Proof is going to back out. So if Tamu actually get these deep wards to spot a lane swap, it could be problems for UBC. UBC did not lane swap in their previous games. And the thing here is Tamu, if they lane swap, they avoid the early game pressure. They shut down DJJ a little bit. And he's a, actually a smite TP Scion. So he, you're going to see a little jungling from him at the start. But the big thing is, if they actually get a lane swap on him, it's so easy to dive him without a flash. And it's a Scion who's immobile in the first place. He's a little durable, but you can still get a four-man roam onto him and make it very effective. So I'm watching for DJJ and what ends up happening yeah, to that lane. Take, that take a look at in. this recall. He's coming down the mid lane right now, probably going to be starting at the Dire Wolf camp so he can get that level two. He wants to be on the strong side of the map. Now, these wards from UBC are spotting out AM's duo lane in the bottom. Yeah, they really want this because it's a strong matchup. Urgot Nautilus is just such an oppressive lane, but they're going to walk backwards. They might start a camp here and get that early level two. So taking it nice and slow as they are going to start with that uh, Krug camp. And it looks like DJJ feels confident enough to start with the Raptor. That means Proof doesn't get a leash. Picarus starting off with his Gromp as well. They also avoid all yeah. the wards, too. UBC isn't spotted by any wards, at least their top laner isn't. So DJJ is safe with doing this camp. And Texas A&M don't know if the lane swap's coming or not. Yeah, so the, with that, they actually don't even fully clear out the Krug camp. They managed to take, I believe that was the large Krug, or the small Krug. It's one or the other. It was one of the Krugs. It's one or the other. There's a 50-50 <laughs> chance. So they take one of the Krugs. They're going to get a nice experience advantage in lane. Already the harass begins. Forgive me, putting some pressure they on the red. They have to take into account the level two from UBC, though. Oh, the snare finds Chuck Normus. Ignite is dropped as well. He's down to 200 health. He's got the, the stinger. It's first blood. Remy picks it up. They're still following on to Forgive me, but he gets out. They were trying to push up against them, and UBC oh, was going. Oh, the BM. Just, oh. oh, man. Oh. But they, they over-pushed there. They were trying to get the stacks of the Relic Shield off to try and just get those creeps down faster, but they didn't take into account the experience that UBC had. You saw it right there. Urgot lands an ability, and if you get the passive from the Nautilus on somebody, you're going to land the Noxian Corrosive Charge and follow up. That was huge damage there, and they get an early first blood. It's only three minutes in the game, and this bottom lane is already showing how oppressive it is. Yeah, the pressure coming out from UBC is looking fantastic. We talked about their mechanical skill, and that's exactly what we saw. Remy and Heat Waves coming up big in that bottom lane. And this is good, too, because the games that I was watching previously, Remy was all of the lane presence in this lane. He was playing Nami, putting E on himself, and auto-attacking. He was the only one trading, and Heat Waves were just trying to CS. This looks like a more aggressive bottom lane, and I don't know if it's because they think they're just able to take the fight to Texas A&M earlier, but they're really just this a little uncharacteristic of Heat Waves and Remy. They seem on the same page, and I know that Heat Waves was struggling with possible land jitters. You know, he was just hoping that he could take deep breaths and let it all level out. And it seems to be working for him. Yeah, he's, he seems to be in a really happy spot, even dropping the spam lap. Oh, he goes for in! A forgive Proof's me, Suck goes in. Chuck Normus is going to be caught out. They turn on to Forgive Me. He's forced to flash away. The hook pulls him back in. He's snared. Could this be another kill for the bottom lane? He flashes. Proof picks it up. UBC with two kills in the bottom lane. This is something you don't prepare for when you watch UBC's games. Proof. Every time you see him, he's playing to DJJ or Bobchit, his solo laners. Every game that I've watched, they don't camp this bottom lane. They leave it on an island. And now, this is a different playstyle from UBC that is really hard to research. You couldn't see this coming. Yeah, Texas A&M feeling like they might be gasping for air here. Luckily, it is only five minutes in. They've got time to recover. They've got time to get themselves back together. It's still very early in the game, and it isn't the Snowball Ekaterina that's getting the kills. Yeah, that's the thing. Is It's hard to gank for this lane, though. This bottom lane has so much gank assistance. Going top, it's a Diana. You can get in there. But the fact that Proof is going for all of these early moves, he's still only level three, and Picarus is farming up level four on the Nunu, looking for the early dragon, but they're just going to ward it up. He's not going to go for that cheesy fourth dragon. Or, cheesy. Level 4 Dragon. Level 4 Dragon. It's not so cheesy, but it's a strategy <laughs> on Nunu. Yeah, Boots of Mobility Remy means he's free to go around and drop some wards, feel safe 
that Picarus isn't going to come harass. Recall coming out of Epic Lynx, or I guess Retreat Ping, as he sees Proof walking on top up there. Epic Lynx seems like he's doing okay. Yeah, he's doing fine in that lane. Diana is a comfort pick for him in the top lane. And he's trying to bring it out here and show what he's got on that Assassin. But he's not going to be able to get a whole lot of kill potential on a Scion. Taking down a Scion as a Diana is a very tall order. Oh, yeah. He, pa he packs a lot more damage than you would think. He's very deceptive in his face damages. And he gets tanky. And Diana's very bursty. And if Scion goes back and buys first item, Spectre's Cowl, you're almost never going to kill him in lane. This is pretty much a farm up for Epic Lynx, hoping that he gets in the late game. But who's he going to blow up? It's a tanky Urgot. It's going to be a tanky top laner. Proof will get tanky as well. It's really, he might be looking for Bob Chin in the late game. That's about it. It is entirely possible. Diana, very strong against Cat. Exactly. Her Moonfall will be able to interrupt her, the ultimate, the, uh, the Death Lotus, but. And that is also, that point. as you mentioned in Champions, like huh? this is a ball delivery system. Oh. Potential roam from Epic Shots. Decides not to walk through Tribrush. Uh, Bob Chin started shoving the wave as soon as possible. Or got harassed. After he left. So if he had gone bottom and was spotted by Ward, he would have just lost even more CS. And this top lane, though, this top lane is actually going heavily in favor of DJJ at this point. There's no more potions left in the inventory of Epic Lynx. And he's slowly but surely oh, getting no. chunked down. And now it's Bob Chin's time to show up top and possibly get a kill here. You have to watch out for this, Gary though. situation. Three minions. Oh, and they don't make it to the turret in time, which means... Oh, Bob just comes in from behind. Epic Lynx. He gets a good flank, but gets out of there. Epic Lynx flashes He's got once again. Left. Bob Chin takes a hit and gets out alive. Oh, an action in the bottom. This is Heat Waves too far forward. They're looking for a kill, though. He dropped though. two, and they're Remy ready went for Epic Shots. Action all across the map. He has no mana. Oh, Epic Shots forced to flash away, but with his team behind him, he escapes, and they immediately turn onto the dragon. That's the dragon. That's the objective control that Tamu plays for, the team fights. Remy left lane to go deal with mid, and as soon as he left to go ward up, immediately Tamu collapsed on that bottom lane, and Picarus got some early assistance and starts getting these dragons to fall into their hands, which is desperately needed on this new dude. Yeah, big play from Texas A&M picking up that dragon. They did get their first kill, so they're not out of this just yet. They're still feeling very strong, confident enough to make these team plays. And that was one of their big concerns, making it out of the laning phase without being at too much of a deficit. Right now it's only 700 gold, but they do have that first dragon. Yeah, it's been a rough early game so far for Texas A&M. And they're definitely right to think it's going to be a struggle for them. You can see Chuck Normus actually got an Avarice Blade first item. He didn't go for the pickaxe. Oh, he goes for that. Lands. But look at this. He doesn't have a lot of trading potential with that item either. They're pretty much playing on the back foot for the whole remainder of this lane bottom. And that Avarice Blade, he's just trying to get to that late game. He's trying to get to that mid game. But you can't let them dominate you too hard in this early game. Ooh, Bob Chin has got a ward so he can ward jump away. Yep, makes it under turret. Proof showing his face as well. Nice harass from Picarus. It is pretty tough for him to get any ganks across. As it is a highly mobile mid lane and a very tanky top lane, but he did get some effectiveness in the bottom. And there is the uh, Sightstone pickup from Picarus. I'm sure we're going to see Forgive Me pick up his own in just a second. Texas A&M do love their Deep Vision. Yeah, they're mostly going for gold at the moment. Deep Vision will come in later. He upgraded his shield just to make sure that he could get some extra gold in coming, that he can end up a little bit better for the wear in the bottom lane. And yeah, this top lane, like I said, he's not going to have kill pressure for a very, very long time, if ever, on this Diana versus the Scion. So Epic Lynx, he's going to take a beating here. He's going to take a really big beating for a while. Picarus has to carry, uh, come up to the lane and take the experience and take the gold because the TP is still down. Yeah, so that is going to be a bit of a miss minion wave for Epic Lynx. He did talk about the fact how he wants to kill DJJ in lane. He wants to solo kill the very aggressive top laner of DJJ. But it doesn't look like it's going to be happening this game. He's 20 CS down and he does have one death. Something that happened during all of the group stages for Texas A&M is they actually won their lane phases. And this is a very different game for them. Oh, Chuck no. Normus. The flash! Oh, suppression! No. Chuck Normus! You're running the wrong way, friend! He's going to be caught out here. Snare lands. Who's going to be He's just trying to get the, the CS before he dies? Yeah, Heat Waves gets it. Oh, very unfortunate. Great positioning from UBC. 
They're just picking on this bottom lane with their pick potential on a single target. They don't care if it's Gragas, they don't care if it's the Chuck Normus on the Lucian. They're going to go after whoever is in range, and that's where they're trying to actually just get the dagger in and twist it so that they can end this game. It's all off his bottom lane. And as soon as Heatwave starts getting tanky, there isn't really a squishy target aside from the Katarina, but Bob Chin's cleanup duty. He's not going to be a primary initiator in this team. Yeah, Heatwaves is already stacking up his tier of the Goddess and getting closer and closer to his Monomune. Minion Wave shoved in the bottom. UBC look like they want to try putting some pressure onto this tier one. If they can knock that down, get Remy roaming. Oh, the hook lands on the Picarus, but it is just Harass. UBC just trying to maintain that advantage and keep Chuck Normus, as you said, on the back foot. Chuck Normus has pretty much been on the back foot all game long since yeah. the very, very beginning. Since what, minute three? Yeah, pretty much. When you don't take into account that the enemy did the Gromp, yeah. <laughs> you look at their health bars, you look at their mana, have they cast spells. And, and then they, they thought they there. were so clever, clever too, because they cleared half of the Krugs just to make sure that they would get an experience camp. But I guess the Gromp gives more experience than one Krug. Yes, that's how jungle camps work, fortunately. <laughs> fortunately. Oh, Hook finds Forgive Me. He's got his explosive cast. Proof's here too, immediately. Though. Proof with the flank. Forces the flash out of Forgive Me. He's still running for his life. Is he going to get out alive? Teleport coming in from Epic Links. Tamu trying to turn it. He actually completes the teleport here. It's followed up by DJJ. Is he going to dive it? This is starting to look like a bad situation. DJJ turns onto Forgive Me. Epic Links snared out. Chuck Normus doesn't have the Epic damage. Shots. Oh, man. Getting a shield onto Epic Links. Proof chasing. Shockwave Epic is big. Shots. He picks up one kill. He's going to run under the turret. But Bob Chin. Oh, boy. That Katarina is hungry. Yeah, a lot of team fighting to be happening this game. And here's the thing is, is whoever shows up first in greater numbers is usually going to get that first kill. It's only one to one, though, in the overall trade. So that's actually really good for Texas A&M. They have some damage control here. But look, there might be even more coming out here. Bob uh -oh. Chin is still in this first push. And they don't oh, know. Oh, and they're bursting down. Check Norma's heel is burned. He gets away alive. And Picarus is forced to flash. Whew. In the jaws of the beast, and he gets out alive. Bloodthirsty games. Yeah. I love it. I love <laughs> it. So much fighting. I was talking about, I want to get to those team fights. Lane phase, you know, whoever gets it might have that edge. But I'm really interested in the shot calling here, because the game seems very hectic. It's yeah. only a 1.3k gold lead, and you're going to see right here, the TP comes in early. Diana Epic Links doesn't try to go for the Q. He goes for the R first, so he doesn't have a reset on it to re-gap close and continue the fight. They get Forgive Me because he went a little too far forward past the TP point, and now Epic Shots comes in for the nice cleanup there onto Heat Waves. Big thing, Picarus is not involved in this fight at all. He's farming the jungle as Nunu. He's not there in time just because of his positioning before the fight. Yeah, and that's going to put Samu a little bit of a better situation. Now, Dragon is spawning. It's 10, 20 seconds before it's up. Wards all over the pit for both AM and UBC, but no teleport for either of these top laners. DJJ, however, has got an enormous mobility ultimate that can get him across the map. Dragon spawns. Nobody wants to deal with it just yet. They're content to sit in the landing phase. Interestingly enough, Chuck Normus is a level up on Heat Waves. A lot of people have been showing up to his lane. Forgive me, has been out of the lane a decent amount, so he's getting solo experience for a tiny bit. It's very close, though, in terms Ooh, of experience. Epic but shots. Oh, he's going to be collapsed oh. on here, but he's got back up from Picarus. They find Proof. Shockwave gets oh, tossed this is a really good fight for zero. Tamu. Put some damage onto Proof. Are they going to turn it? They do. Picarus picks it up. Bob Chin forced to jump away. Without the jungler, Tamu can take their second dragon. Oh, they have to zone away Heat Waves and Remy, however. There they go. Are they going to try contesting this? UBC just might. Well, it's a low picker as oh, Bob Chin no. wants to go after this. Forgive me, goes forward. He gets in Remy's in. Remy out of position. More damage comes across. He's picked up by Epic Shots, evening the kills. UBC trying to turn it. Forgive me, drops, but he's a support. Bob Chin gets one. Is he looking for two? He's going to turn on to Epic Shots, but Epic Shots kites him away. And for Chuck Normus getting out of there. They're turning. Epic Links picks up another kill with the Assassin Diana. Great damage coming across from Heat Waves, forcing Epic Shots to flash and Epic Links. Oh, he takes some damage. Is he going to get out of the skill shot? He is. That's a favorable trade for Texas A&M. The gold is almost even again, just off of team fighting. As soon as UBC started making it a team fight game, Tamu seems to be on top of this right now. 
Oh, UBC starting the dragon here. They They'll, know that uh, Tamu's weak. They'll get it. Enough members were dead, and enough members were had to be backed off and pushed away from it. They got the vision control earlier, so UBC, they do end up negative for that trade, but they don't let the Nunu get another dragon to prevent that fifth dragon snowball from happening earlier. Yeah, this is fantastic for a and as they are getting towards the end of the laning phase at the end of that volatile era of the game. And they're coming out rather even. It's only about a 400 gold lead for University of British Columbia and a and they're starting to transition into those powerful team fights. And we've already seen with a couple of fights in this game. UBC are very, very strong. They're very highly mechanically skilled, but a and are keeping up with excellent positioning. I mean, Epic Shots has been coming up huge with those shockwaves. Yeah. Epic Shots, shockwave, Shockwaves have been on point. You can see just from his scoreline how well he's keeping this team together. But this top lane, Epic Links, he's done some work on this top turret. He might get the first turret of the game for his team. Enough pressure from Texas A&M on these lanes. Proof is trying to come top because he knows that Epic Links might actually overextend for this turret and then they can punish him. Picarus is going to have to play to this side of the map for a little bit and possibly free up that turret. But it's just warded and covered and riddled with uh, tunnels at this point yeah. by Proof. Proof of Payment has been very mobile so far. Oh, a and group up in the mid lane. Looks like we've also got uh, Chuck Normus on his way up there as well. This could be the first five-man siege. Teleport almost up for both DJJ, but Ac Epic Links has already got his. Instead, they just camp up on the bottom side of the map, looking for some roams, looking to find someone out of position. Epic Links putting on the moves to DJJ. He oh. actually activates the ultimate. Yeah, proof is right oh. off on the wings. They Smile want to flank points. him. They turn it around. Flash gets him out of there. Epic links. Great flash. Well, they knew he's going to overextend for the turret, so they get his flash pretty much for nothing at that point. Challenging Smite is down for DJJ, so this is another lane that they're not going to be able to leverage too much out of, but they go immediately middle because oh, they man. saw two members top. Everybody collapses here. This is the shot calling from Texas A&M. Urgot's going to be late to this. If they keep the damage up, they'll actually take the turret before Ooh, great a fight damage can even coming across. Oh, so close, but they just can't quite clear the turret in time. Next menu wave spawns, but Heat Waves has made it there in time. They're able to keep it standing for now. Yeah, Texas A&M They've been preparing for this game specifically against UBC for weeks. This has been their sole focus. Yeah, and that's the thing is UBC have actually been looking forward. They've been looking at the next match. They haven't been preparing too much for Texas A&M from what I've heard from them. They are focusing on their own individual play style and playing as a team. They're basically saying, well, we don't need to research you too hard because we're just going to play our own style and dictate the pace of the game, and then you have to get on our level. Whereas Texas A&M, they haven't been preparing for RMU. They haven't been preparing for UConn. They're preparing for this game against UBC. UBC threw them a curveball with that gank bottom over and over again because it's different than what you would research from that team. But their team fighting still holds true. And UBC, it's still that mismatch. They didn't get a huge lead in the laning phase that wasn't overcome by team fighting by Texas A&M. So the goal is actually 200 in favor of Texas A&M already. Yeah, they're starting to get to that comfortable late game. The top turret goes down. Epic Link secures the very first one of the game, forcing the recall out of DJJ, and Proof is even waiting in the wings to catch that minion wave as it bounces off the turret. And the rest of A&M starts sieging up mid as well. Roaming Katarina doesn't have the wave clear. They take down two turrets in quick succession. A&M are turning up the heat. Yeah, and you mentioned the wave clear. This team composition from UBC, no wave clear. Yep. They have no wave clear. They'll have to wait for the Luden's Echo from Katarina, but even then it's not very reliable. They don't have quick AOE ranged wave clear, whereas if you look at the team comp from Texas A&M, they have a lot of it. They have three members who have some good ranged wave clear that they can actually leverage, and that's going to be a problem here for UBC, because side waves will get pushed faster, and then team fights will start around objectives, and even if they're just stalling you out before the team fight, you're going to start losing turret damage little by little because of these minion waves. Yeah, and we're slowly seeing the uh, cracks in UBC's armor as they're whittled down piece by piece. DJJ is going to get some solid damage on the top tier one turret as no one's able to make it in time with Epic Links splitting bottom then covering mid. Vickers, however, is there to catch it. Great, great team play out of AM so far as they are getting that uh, rotation across the map and making sure that nothing falls. UBC. It seems like UBC are kind of floundering a little bit. 
They're looking for something, but it's very hard to leverage without wave clear. That's a big tool that people take for granted in team compositions. Is they're like, all right, we'll just get the turret. It's like, well, can you siege against an Orianna who's going to wave clear your wave instantaneously? You have to have enough dive pressure to actually counter that and dodge past it or dive past it. Everybody right now is playing for this next dragon, though. It'd be number two for either team. Gold is pretty even. Scuttler Crab is in favor of UBC at the moment, but it's still 45 seconds until it's up. Yeah, a and they do get some grouping in the mid. Damage coming out from Epic Lynx as he turns onto DJJ. Some big damage coming across. He's down to about half health, but isn't done quite yet. He's actually taking more burn from the Cinder Hulk than from DJJ himself. He's continuing to provide chase. If you can get DJJ to burn his ultimate, that would be huge. But he gets out of there. Epic Lynx has got his teleport. He's going to have to recall if he wants to make it in time for that dragon when it respawns. And we see the same from DJJ. Yeah, very low mana there from, Dun from DJJ. And Epic Lynx, he's able to take that fight to him. 10 CS down. He survived the laning phase. He's successfully passed that point as this Diana. He's come online. And if he's able to actually duel a Cinder Hulk challenging smite Scion, that's huge for Texas A&M, because that's something that you don't see coming when you pick this matchup. Yeah, Dragon has now spawned. Texas A&M are grouped up. DJJ actually walks down. He doesn't want to burn his teleport. Epic Lynx does have a big wave in the top. Ooh, good harass finds Chuck Normus. But he still gets out just fine. A little bit of clear coming out from UBC as they're finding better positioning. It's five versus five at the Dragon. Everyone's grouped up. Proof starts it. Icarus taking some huge harass from Heat Waves. He's Watch the Oriana Ball in this fight. This is going to be a key point. Is this Oriana Ball? And if they slap it onto Epic Lynx and he dives to the back, who is it going to hit? Oh, here comes the big turn. DJJ goes in. The Shockwave is huge. He's going to find damage. Bob Chin being dived by Epic Lynx in the back while Tamu zones out from the front. Remy goes low. Epic Lynx is going to drop, but two members have already gone down. It's cleaned up by Chuck Normus. They got to deal with that Scion passive, though. It's a triple kill on Chuck Normus. Who needs a laning phase when you pick up a triple? Oh, Bob Chin is looking for the juicy resets. He's going to be zoned away by Forgive Me. Oh, they, they do take it. Oh, man. Texas A&M just got a huge foothold in this game. If they're able to pull off moves like that in yeah. team fights, you have to respect the ball position. UBC are not paying epic shots his dues. He's 2-0 and 5. No deaths. He has been a completely unexploited lane by UBC. They didn't play the Bob Chin this time. Bob Chin's having a rough matchup for one of the first times in the entire collegiate tournament. This guy when I talked to him, he said he's just crushing people. Yeah. And Wesley, DJJ, was telling me that if Bob Chin ever says that he's having a hard time in a lane, that guy must be a god. But right now, you can see right here, the positioning of the ball, backline, DJJ Ooh. goes in and it separates the team. They shockwave the backline. And that means during the entire time that DJJ is in the front line, getting damage onto Epic Shots, Picarus, and Chuck Normus, there's no follow-up because the three damage dealers were all shockwave and Bob Chin was left off on the side. Yeah, huge play from Epic Lynx. You mentioned in Champions, like his sole job would be to find Katarina and just home in on her during fights. And that's exactly what we saw. They're Fight going for it. Double teleport. The shockwave finds three. Remy goes in, but Bob Chin is dealing some big damage. He doesn't have enough follow-up, though. A double kill from Chuck Normus. The barrel knocks DJJ away. A quick two kills for Texas A&M for free. That was a 5v4. Epic Lynx is bottom right now. He's pushing a turret. Epic Shots is doing an amazing job on this Oriana. There's a reason he has played it over and over and over again, and that they were 8-0 throughout their group and regional stages. Yeah, the big name of the game is Brain versus Brawn here. And right now, it looks like the pen has won. It is mightier than the high ELO of UBC. It is a team game. It's a team game. You have to play as a team. And that's what Tamu is showing right now. They're having an amazing display of teamwork with a composition that you wouldn't be like, oh, this is easy wombo combo to pull off. Well, look at this. The ball is right there on Forgive Me, and nobody's paying attention to it. It oh, gets man. three members again. And then Bob Chin jumps in, and the damage wasn't applied because Chuck Normus threw all of his across where the ball was put down. And that was just a great cleanup, great start to the fight there from Texas A&M. Yeah, this is fantastic play from A&M. They are feeling so very, very confident in this. Picarus gets caught going for a deep board. He's taking a lot of damage. It's triple CC that's going to lock him down. 
Heat Waves picks it up. There's a good pick, and oh no. They're looking for Forget Me. There, are they going to find him in the mid lane? He's going under the tier one. Actually, body blocks it. Bob Chin tries to go for the dive. Shockwave to turn it around, but DJJ, they find one kill and immediately turn it into two. Picarus got picked off in the jungle, and it opens up so much of the map. They might be able to get two turrets off of this, because they also <laughs> force Epic Shots back, who's a big source of their wave clear. They need to keep this minion wave alive and they get half of it culling off. That's a good move there by Chuck Normans. Yeah, UPC have to back away from this one. a and still strong. Chuck Normus, after going 0-2, and I believe 2 during the laning phase, is now 5-2-4. and 4. He's coming up so big, completing his IE and his static shiv. Yeah, you have a rough laning phase, you buy an Avarice Blade, and then you end up 31 CS up over your lane opponent, who's an Urgot. It's such an oppressive lane, but once you get out of the laning phase, you can even see Chuck Norris is two levels up over Heat Waves. He's just getting a lot of solo lane experience, a lot of time with minion waves. When they group up as three or four members in the middle, Epic Lynx is off on the side, split pushing. But the person who's picking up the farm is Chuck Norris. They're funneling a lot into him. And Epic Shots is getting a lot of his gold off of kills and assists this game. He is picking up CS. But that's the big part, is he's getting all of these kills and assists, and he's not even falling by the wayside. Death Cap completed, Athene's on Holy Grail, this Orianna's damage, and nobody has really prioritized too much magic resistance yet. We don't see the, the Aegis of the Legion coming out yet. We see a Righteous Glory from Remy, though, to try and start more fights, but they're losing a lot of fights that they're taking on UBC side. Yeah, it's kind of funny to see how UBC is building right now. DJJ is the only one who's got any magic resist with that Spectre's Cowl because he had to deal with a Diana in lane. Diana is not going to attack DJJ. She's going to go straight for Bobchin in the back lane, who's only got that Abyssal Scepter for sustain. But again, things are dead even in this match. It's barely a thousand gold in favor of AM. Even in kills, even in turrets. Very nearly even in dragons. This is neck and neck right now. Cannot wait for the next team fight. It is going to be awesome. Dragons. Dragons is the name of the game here. Texas AM was like, we're gonna pick Nunu so we can go after every dragon. And UBC picked the team fight comp to fight a dragon. But so far, Texas A&M have been leveraging wave clear over them. They've been leveraging team fights and vision control. And ball placement. Epic Shots yeah. has been a huge, huge part of this game. Doing a great job to carry his team out of the laning phase. He said he wanted to play more assassins. <laughs> he goes back to the Orianna and it's doing wonders for him. There's a reason he got here off of Orianna. Yeah. And it's just showing. Oh, Epic Lynx gets caught out. Bob Chin turns it around, though. He's got another dash. He's got Flash and tries to Zonia's. Does he have the swag play to follow it up? No, he gets out of the hook by flashing. He's followed up, however. He's going to be suppressed and gets a shockwave to save him. Epic Lynx is still alive. Chuck Normus kills him. Epic Lynx is doing such work right now. Chuck Normus chasing him around from the back. Bob Chin picks up a kill for revenge. But that amazing bait. A&M pick up three kills, losing only Epic Lynx. That's the teamwork of Texas A&M. They aren't going to leave anybody out to dry. They're going to collapse and take the team fight and take their third dragon of the game off of it. Three for one. They'll take it. A&M coming up big. They're now up in kills, up in dragons. Very soon to be up in turrets if this four-man siege continues mid. No, they're continuing across the map. Are they headed for the Baron? Ooh, there's still a TP left on DJJ. Proof goes for the ultimate across the map. They're going to have two, three members here in time for this Baron. Oh man, Chuck Normus is doing some serious work. Here's Teleport in from behind. Epic Lynx is going to try zoning it out. Remy, right to glory into the pit. Baron's still alive. They're going to drop Remy before he's able to get anything across. Proof is turned upon. AM turning this fight around. They find Heat Waves on the backside. Bob Jin on cleanup duty. He gets two kills. Can he get three? Is he going to get the reset? He is. Follows it up. It's double kill for Heat Waves. UBC capitalizing on the greed of AM. Remy went in a little early, but he was just buying time for DJ Day to respawn and TP in. And then Bob Jin with the cleanup. Oh. Amazing pickup four for one for the just the support. That's gonna be Baron to UBC, and they get themselves right back in the game and in the lead. Yeah, Ping's now going down onto the bot tier two turret. UBC take down this Baron. They're probably gonna have to recall after this as they are very low health. Yeah, a great pickup from UBC. Who needs dragons when you can get Baron? Yeah, they peeled off of it very early from Texas AM. It looked like they were just trying to stop UBC from getting in and then they all pulled off of it. DJJ teleported in, and nobody 
was in that pit with him. You're going to see it right here. Epic Link's TP's in, and then they're like, we have to go help him and flank. Remy comes in, does some damage, but then they back off. Nobody's dealing damage to the Baron anymore. Chuck Normus peels off mid as well. DJJ's in the pit. But that Baron's at 3k HP. They still have a smite available, they still have a consume, and instead they try to go for the team fight against people who just respawned. They just purchased, they just got back to full HP. And that was a huge cleanup there. I don't know if they were expecting Bob Chin to be there, because when you're running around with low HP bars, you should always have that Katarina on your mind. Yeah, and AM played that out excellently, tried to make the best of that situation, but they just needed an extra three seconds, four seconds on the death timer in order to feel a little bit more comfortable. With that, they all respawn. What can UBC take with this Baron buff? Grouped up in the mid and top. This is really good for UBC as a composition as well. They're 1K up, they have Baron, but they lack the wave clear. When you have Baron though, it's gonna take care of it for you. So now it's all on Texas A&M to spread out their wave clear appropriately to deal with the Baron buff while it's on and then take a team fight when they see the opening for it. DJJ, he has it as well. He's going to just push this top wave and try to get pressure and try to get some damage on these turrets because that's the problem is cracking these tier 2 turrets is difficult for UBC. Yeah, split push Scion doing work in the top. Epic, Epic Lynx is going to be the one who catches him. While the rest of UBC group up in the mid, they do have a rotation set up so they can swing to the top wave, but instead they decide to just keep the pressure on, prevent AM from getting out from under this siege. And it looks like AM are going to be able to hold for now. Oh, bit of damage, finds proof. Still doing just fine, Bob Chin. Very, very scary on that Katarina as he looks for any sort of opening. But he's not going to dive the rotation from UBC as they swing up towards the top side. They are going to get a little bit of damage onto this tier two. Scion taking the turret. Epic links. Ooh. Forces DJJ to get out of there. And UBC are just trying to get past these tier two turrets in the wave clear. They have to play around it. You have to kind of skitter with ward control, let their ward control expire threaten them with the fact that you could fight them in the jungle if they showed up and try to clear the waves as fast as possible. It's difficult. Scion, you know, he does have some good wave clear. He has okay wave clear. It falls off later, though, when his base damages are at their maximum. But as you can see, it's almost no match now for the triple wave clear yeah. from Texas A&M. And even clearing it out in the mid lane, Chuck Normus didn't rotate with the rest of his team so that he could bounce that wave, and now he's roaming down towards the bottom to get some more Krugs. He's probably pr pretty close to that last Whisper. When you come to this bottom wave that's going to keep pushing out, there isn't a Baron to get. UBC is just going to send somebody to go clear that bottom wave that's pushing against them. Dragon's up in a minute and 10. It would be the yeah. fourth one for Texas A&M. UBC had that on their mind. They weren't able to press their Baron buff. They didn't get a turret off of having Ooh. Baron. All right. They okay. weren't able to snowball that anymore because of the way the composition set up. It's, co it's a composition for fighting at Dragons. It's not a composition for fighting under turrets. Or it, it can dive a little bit, but the problem with it is siege situations are absolutely terrible for it. Yeah, this is an uncomfortable position for a &M right now. We can see them. They want this dragon. Dragon number four is a very important dragon, but they're kind of scrambling for wards right now. They don't have that deep vision that they're so accustomed to with some of those earlier team fights. They do get the Scuttle Crab and manage to get some solid warding around the pit itself, but they cannot control the jungle as UBC are very strong, very pick oriented. There's the grouping. We've had a bit of a lull for the first time in the game. Yeah, I know. <laughs> because UBC are not going for those big team fights anymore. They're the ones who've been starting most of them with their Righteous Glory and the Nautilus Ultimate, trying to just get in there, or even the Scion Ultimate but they've kind of held off. They used their Baron buff up, they got some damage on turrets, they didn't take any, but they're not going for the team fights anymore. They aren't going for the bloody battles. They're trying to be a little more calculated about it, and that's been a problem for UBC, is not being calculated about the fights they take. They were talking about how they don't fight for, any, for no reason anymore, 
We've seen a couple of those. Oh, but no. fighting over the dragon is what they really oh, want to do. They no. want to have an objective in their sights. Chuck Normus got caught recalling. He was spotted out by a ward placed by Remy. So instantly UBC collapse onto the dragon. They know they can fight this 5v4. Minor misplay from Chuck Normus. He does get his last Whisper, but he has to sack over that dragon to UBC. They get their second it's one. The they turn it around. They're going to try to make this fight. Forgive me, tanking in the front line. Chuck Normus on the side drops a culling. Zoning ultimate comes across from Picarus, and AM are going to look to get out of this. The hook lands. They're going to turn it into a fight. Epic Lynx dives on the Bob Chin in the back line, but he's suppressed. He's forced to back away while Chuck Normus kites DJJ away. No one has died yet. Epic Lynx dropping the Zonias. Is he going to get out of this alive? He does not. Bob Chin. Bob Chin picks it up with a double kill, but Chuck Normus is on to Heat Waves. He goes down as well. It's another kill. Quadra kill. Penta kill for Bob Chin. He gets. The reset's coming through. This game has been all about the mid laners. At first, epic shots. Now, Bobchin, the last two fights, has shown up huge for his team on this Katarina last pick. Amazing play from UBC as Bobchin gets a penta kill in game number one. AM have not dropped a single game in the group stages. They're 8 and 0 right now. Could this be their first stumbling block? They've had a very good showing so far, but this Katarina out of nowhere is just taking over the game. Bobchin got to a point where he was struggling in the laning phase. He wasn't doing too high. He wasn't getting the attention from Proof. Now, absolutely crazy. It could be Texas A&M giving up their first loss. Oh, Epic Lynx is going to find a free kill but as he did burn his teleport. But not if Epic Lynx has anything to say about it. Yeah, he's going for Chase. DJJ did burn his ultimate. Epic Lynx has Flash, too, and he knows it's a sign. He's not going to have him. Oh, is he? Oh, oh, no. Oh, he's going for Bob Chin. Bob oh! Chin! Sonya's comes out! Bob Chin! He makes it! Oh, and he finally goes down. Shut down. Epic Lynx picks up the gold. Much needed. Pings go, going down into the mid lane. Oh, they're going for the Baron. Yeah, Bob Chin Baron. is dead it's for 40 a... seconds. And he was the big problem last time they went for Baron. DJJ doesn't have his ultimate up just yet. He'll be up in a bit. They have to get this bear down quickly, though. Ooh, Epic Shot's actually tanking it for a little bit. Has brought down the half health. Proof waiting in the wings. He's not spotted out by it's a, a ward. He's got though. a ward in the pit. Oh, he doesn't get the he steal. Comes in anyway. in. DJ Trey tries to force a fight. Chuck Normus is low. Epic Shot's is low. He's going to end up dropping to 200 health. The slowest kite in the history of the world, but he's still alive. Proof goes down. DJJ running for his life. As o a and &M. They're still in this. Yeah, when Bob Chin goes down, he's not in these fights. The cleanup, you don't have to worry about it. Epic shots, Chuck Normus, such low AP for so long. That was a crazy fight for them. <laughs> UBC, they're fighting again. They're not giving up these objectives. And the goal is, once again, just 1.4K difference now. And you can see DJJ, he goes in. This is the pentakill here from Bob Chin. He plays off to the side. He plays down. He knows that there's no absolute zero. He knows that some ultimates are down. There goes the shockwave. And then the moonfall comes out. And he goes off to the side, waits it out, kites, lets, lets heat waves actually get his damage off. Ulti's here. He still has his own Zonias, by the way, too. Bob Chin is sitting on his Zonias active, but he's got full confidence that they're going to clean up right afterwards. He comes in, and then the fight has still been going on. It's a big, tanky front line. There's an Ergon in this game. There's a Scion. There's a Nunu. These are going to get drawn out, and they, everybody gets whittled down to the point where the Katarina is just such a useful pick if she's able to stay alive throughout the duration and weave in and out of the fight. Yeah, one of the problems with UBC's team compositions in the past has been that they pick four members and build a team comp, and then Bob Chin just kind of does what he wants. He picks LeBlanc or Zed, something that he's comfortable on. But this time on Katarina, it seems like it fits rather well. He's doing exceptionally well in this game. It fits the meta of the game at the moment and the way yeah. he's playing it. I think he's still doing his own thing. Though. Yeah. <laughs> He is doing rather well in this game. It's still dead even. Only 500 gold separate these two teams. It is so tense. And the fact that they have wave, like, UBC, we've talked about it a bunch. Lack of wave clear. When your Baron buffed up minions come through and you have a lack of wave clear, you're going to lose turrets. You have to take a fight or you have to see the turrets. Oh, Epic Shot is in the front line. The they turn it around. Oh, the ultimate comes out, but Pickers is instantly knocked Bob out. Bobchin drops the Zonius and everyone collapses onto him. He goes down. Epic Shot is still alive. Chuck Normus is going to be CC locked, however. Epic Link's trying to drop some Epic AoE. And he drops. It's two kills for UBC. It's three, actually. It's a three for three. one in the overall. They end up being 2K gold up. But once again, 
Their wave clear isn't that great. They have to push side waves very far in. They've already got the middle inhibitor, and now they are basically doing wave clear duty. There is a minute left before the next dragon is up. Fourth and third for the teams respectively. But this is gonna be a longer game. We're gonna <laughs> yeah. see some, some more fights here. This game is far from over at this point. Oh yeah. Three to six in turrets right now. UBC knocking down that mid inhibitor opened up so much of the map for them. And despite the fact that AM had Baron buff, they were sieging down a lane in which they had no inhibitor. Yeah. They had to contend with five members, a turret, and super minions. It, it's good to do that, though, when you have the wave clear advantage, because you just push it out. You make sure that you don't have a side wave that's pushing against you. You just go down the wave that has the super minions, so you never have to worry about that pressure. It's never that lingering thing in the back of your mind. That's like, well, we only have a minute to be here because Super Minions are going to be on our Nexus turrets in a little bit. They completely negate that by going middle. And like I said, you either fight it or you seed the turret, and UBC went for the fight. And now, 15 seconds, 10 seconds on this dragon. And I think we're going to see another fight. I think uh, that's a <laughs> professional <laughs> analyst opinion. Pretty that safe we will bet. probably see a fight around this dragon. It's a pretty safe bet. Everyone's grouped up around this side. There is a bit of deep vision on the blue buff, but it gets cleared out. AM. Do get superior positioning. Oh, wow. Got to get them wards down. Oh, man. They've got five wards in two bushes. Immediately turning onto the dragon. DJJ turns it around. They secure it. That's dragon number four. Can they take the follow-up fight? Chuck Normus kites it around. Epic shots is turned upon. He goes down. Bob Chin, Bob Chin with a triple kill. A oh, quadra kill. Is he going to get a second penta kill? Oh, my goodness. He does no, not. He doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. Remy steals the <laughs> penta kill number two. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh, Remy, you dirty rat! <laughs> he took the <laughs> That's gonna be UBC pushing down the mid lane, though. They're gonna be able to get this oh, inhibitor man. back up for themselves. 30 seconds on the death timers here. Dom, this might be game. They just just might be. It's 20 seconds until Gragas comes up. The Zonius is burned. Nexus turret one goes down. Nexus turret two is gonna be followed up upon. UBC looking to end a and spree and take game number one. They do indeed. UBC take the win. And add the first defeat in the collegiate tournament to Texas A&M. That was a hectic back and forth game. We talked about the team fights coming out and how important that's going to be. <laughs> Both teams went for team fights yeah. <laughs> over and over and over again. And man, if you have friends who aren't watching, get them to start watching because these oh, games yeah. are going to be bloody and fun. No matter no matter who you're rooting for, these are going to be some fun League of Legends games to watch. It's game one, and my voice is already hurt a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that was absolutely amazing. You just saw on camera Remy standing up with the rest of his team. Yeah, I'm surprised. With a Bob grin from smack ear to ear. I know. <laughs> I'm still surprised that he isn't right now, taking that second pentakill in his first debut on stage. He, he got one pentakill. He did so, get one. Yeah. He did get one. Yeah. But it is Katarina, to be fair. It's true. Okay, okay. You know what? So when you get nine kills, you get a quadra and a penta. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's like a real Katarina penta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You that's, expect at least a penta and a quadra. That's game. what it counts up for. Man, great play. UBC playing so strong. But yeah. we're going to go ahead and uh, toss it over to our analysts, and they're going to break down exactly what happened. Dash, it's all you. Thank you, gentlemen. I mean, that was an incredibly exciting game. I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better game one to start off the weekend here yeah. at the Collegiate Championships. Uh, there's so much to talk about. I mean, this this game played entirely to the story of these two teams, right? Yeah. Uh, UBC coming out strong, looking great in lanes early. Texas A&M regrouping as we approach that mid game and taking objectives and finding a way back into the game. Yeah, I, I mean, especially there were a couple of times where you would see uh, UBC go for very aggressive plays. I think there were two ganks top. One worked, one didn't. And instantly, without hesitation or anything, Texas A&M says, okay, we'll take Dragon. Or we'll uh, chunk your mid lane tower to 10%, right? We're going to continue to set up breaking your turret lines, getting ahead of you on these objectives. And you can feed that Katarina all you want. Clearly, it worked out for them by the end of it, right? But for a majority of the game, they were hanging in there. And it was because they kept moving when UBC was just wanting to fight. Yeah. Uh, speaking of that, Katarina, let's uh, talk a little bit about... Uh, 
UBC's composition and their approach to the game and how, I mean, she ended up securing a pentakill and a quadra kill yeah. in this Pentakill and a half, we'll call it. Pentakill yeah. and a half, I like it. Yeah. Yeah, and we can look at this going right into this replay. You can see them set up for it. All of Tamu is going to be split up here. The Shockwave only hits one, and this is the big factor because all the fights they win, it hits multiple targets. Now Epic Link's swapped out with that hyperkinetic position reverser into the backside. We're going to see him go in, and he blows all of his cooldowns. Does not get Bob Chin, and this sets him up for the perfect kill. Able to clean through. You can see Epic shots on the back line completely out of mana. Chuck Normus out of position, and this is just an easy cleanup at this stage. I, yeah, and... and Honestly, this is exactly what they picked their team to do. Uh, we were talking about it earlier. I kind of call it a one-threat comp, right? Urgot certainly does a lot of damage. All these characters can be individual contributors, but you build a bunch of tanky guys with CC and you have a Katarina, you have one thing in your mind, and they played it out perfectly right there. Nunu and Diana are able to get into the back and almost take him out, but the peel is just strong enough from all of the other frontliners that once those two were down, it was pretty easy from there. Yeah, the important thing to note there is that that was a fight that they aggressed, yeah. right? So their frontliners were preventing Diana for, for the majority, or for the first half of that fight to even get to that back line. The Urgot reposition was used on Diana to make it even more difficult for her to get on top of the Katarina. Whereas earlier in the game, we saw Epic, uh, Epic Links able to zone out Katarina, zone that threat out of the fight for a much longer period of time while, uh, while Lucian was able to take down the back right. line. Yeah. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, it just comes down to Epic Shots as a player being probably the most important person of the game for Texas A&M this time around, right? Uh, we had a fight earlier in the game where Lynx was able to zone them off and kind of deny that pentakill, right? And it was because... We they... have that replay. We'll pull it up, actually. Oh, okay. We can kind of well, talk about that. We can do that. But it's because they start them off with these beautiful shockwaves. Uh, so we'll get into it right here, right? The fight begins, you know, they're, they're kind of getting ready to do Dragon here. Poking around at it, and then there is the three-man shockwave, and Epic Lynx is in the top, doing his job zoning. It doesn't matter if he dies at this point, because the whole reason they picked that Diana has been completed. The camera pans down, and where did everyone go? You see they've all pretty much died to the combined might here. Forgive me, does a little bit of zoning work here to make sure they can finish off the Dragon, but Pretty crucially, even if the Shockwave doesn't land on the damage dealers, it's softening up these huge tanks. It's making sure a lot of forward momentum and a lot of damage can be put out on them. That didn't happen in the previous replay. And so when you're not stopping Cat with your Shockwaves and you're not crushing the tanks with your Shockwaves, Katarina is going to find a way to get that kill, and she did. And in the early to mid game, they had a few seconds to stop the Katarina with the death lows. They had a little bit of time. But as we approached the late game, you saw that single ward not seeing the flank from Katarina just ends in an instant pentacle because Katarina at that stage of the game does so much damage. And with so many people grouped, she can just clean through the entire team fight. Yeah. Right. So uh, taking a step back at look, looking at this game, right? Uh, Texas A&M knew that mechanically they probably weren't as strong. So we have to try and they have to try and figure out how they're going to shore up those weaknesses. And where I saw it shine through the most was going to be in that bot lane. Right. Right? Misjudging that level two engagement was awful. Yeah. In all honesty, it was awful. Right? You give up two early kills in the game by not respecting the level two of Urgot Nautilus. It's already a 2v2 they didn't want. And then to go into it heads up and be a little bit too aggressive in it right. was a huge mistake. Yeah, I mean, you got to call it what it is, right? It was not a fantastic series of plays made by Chuck Normus and uh, Forgive Me, I Suck. Hopefully they did forgive him for that early game. Uh, you know, you can sometimes be like, oh, maybe I didn't know they went for the Gromp. You don't expect it, right? But you should be able to see their health and mana have kind of been drained. You're like, okay, I see it hasn't, you know, they have taken a lot of damage. They've probably gone for this. And Lucian was in melee range of the Nautilus when that level two came, right? When you know that you're down that XP, you can't go for it. And then another thing, he bought the Avarice Blade before coming back to lane the second time, right? And was like, we're gonna fight now. It's like, you're not actually that strong. The idea they wanted to fight because they hadn't bought yet. Uh, and then fantastic job from Rek'Sai, right? Proof of payment being like, I know that they're gonna try to aggress and end up getting the second kill. And that sent them behind super far. 
But the thing about this team is that no matter how far behind they are, like you said earlier, they always manage to trade something back. And so looking forward, looking to the next game, as to what they need to change, I mean, I don't think that's an indication of the bot lane's skill overall. I think that's just a single mistake that they made. No, yeah, it's absolutely just an adjustment that they need to make, right? And I think part of it is probably a little bit of jitters coming into the yeah. big, you know, the big stage, the big games. And we saw them end up playing the team fights very well. Both, forgive me, I suck, and uh, excuse me as I lose the name. Uh, Picarus? Pick uh, no, no, no. Jungle? The AD for? carry. The <laughs> Chuck Normus. Chuck, Chuck Normus. There, there you go. go. Um, both of them moving into the team fights played them very well, as you already mentioned. Yeah. Uh, forgive me, zoning fantastically throughout all the fights, and his scoreline isn't going to represent it properly because he was sacrificing himself in every single team fight in order to protect his back line. And same thing with Chuck Normus. We saw the triple kill in that fight. He's playing it properly in the team fights. Yeah. It's on them, though, to come out of that lane phase safe. We've already seen what Texas A&M uh, can do coming out of lane with no kills. They should be okay with that. They should feel like if we come out 10 CS behind, that's a win for us because we're going to out-rotate them for dragons, out-rotate them for turrets. Yeah, I, I, think, I think if we wind it back to champion select for a moment and we look at what the teams ended up picking up, I think there's two notable improvements, one per each team that you could make. For uh, on the side of Texas A&M, if you get a little bit harder peel instead of the Nunu, and on the side of uh, UBC, you get a little better wave clear, some of those weaknesses that we saw play out in these epic fights get short out. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the other thing about this team, we touched on it earlier, this rivalry between these teams. And, um, and I think one of the fears for University of British Columbia coming in was that they were going to be overlooking this, uh, this matchup a little bit, looking straight to the finals. And, and I feel like that was a little bit apparent there in the early game. They, you know, they got, uh, there's a little hubris behind it. Yeah. But both of these teams def definitely have strong feelings about the either. This year we have two new players from last year and uh, I feel like we've just gotten better mechanically in every role. We kind of like hand selected this team. We incorporated a support staff, a manager, a coach, and an analyst. We really have an advantage that we all get along as a team. We really enjoy playing with each other. I think we have the best players in every role for collegiate. I don't think there's really anything all that special about a and I expect a pretty easy win tomorrow. We've always known that UBC is the other big college team, especially coming out of the West. And we've played them in other tournaments like Ivy Law and CSL. So getting them in the first round is like, okay, let's like show what we're made of and see if we can really take them out. I'm just most excited to finally get to play We've been practicing, we've been hyping it up. I'm just finally excited to get onto the rift and beat them. I think it's an advantage that we're the quote underdog because we have nothing to lose. We've been here before, we're all like really like old school players. For, for me personally, like Proof is definitely the best jungler, like, or besides me, but um, <laughs> he does prioritize early ganks a little more than me and he uh, really knows how to read the map and also while getting farm, which if we see him, we're able to counter gank him and stop his early game, I think like definitely we'll have the upper hand. Uh, I think A&M should get some tickets to Disneyland to salvage their trip because there is not going to be a third place match on Sunday. We've heard that UBC doesn't really respect us that much and I've been thinking about RMU. I think that's a big mistake on UBC's part. If they haven't prepped for us or don't respect us, we will win. Well, it's good to be confident, right? I mean, there's no point in them playing if they don't think they can win. It just makes it better for us when we crush them. In solo queue ranking, I basically have enough LP to have more than all of Texas combined. UBC will definitely 2-0 Texas. And for Texas A&M, you heard Picarus kind of talk about his respect for proof of payment, his fear of proof of payments, more early game style junglers. And uh, they let the Rek'Sai get through in that pick ban, which was really surprising for me. So while I feel that Texas A&M had a solid strategy and they executed it reasonably well, uh, maybe switch up the Nunu for a Rek'Sai, maybe find a way to deny him that early game pick because we saw them get behind early. And while they may be comfortable with it, it might not be something they can afford to do again. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we had been going over it, right? Proof actually does not enjoy the tanks that are kind of seeing play a lot right now, right? Like, does not actually like playing Sejuani, is not a big fan of that, would much more prefer the uh, Nidalee and the Rek'Sai, right? So that's where we see those bands coming through. Uh, to touch a little bit on what I was saying earlier, uh, I think if you are Texas A&M, I mean, in all the features we've had today, you see they're close friends, they've played a lot. We even noted on the desk during the game, during some of the team fights, they were laughing, they were getting excited, they're really getting into this. You know, I think you could run that same comp back. I disagree a little bit on the Nunu. I think you could use something that has a little bit more of a hard stop to contain Bob Chin. But you could run that back. If you are UBC, though, and you run the same comp again, I think a and might have the download on you, right? The lack of wave clear, the over-focus on Bob Chin, you build a slightly better containment field around that guy, and we could be seeing a game three very easily. And on the topic of champion select, we have to note, uh, University of British Columbia has admitted that Champion Select is probably their weakest, uh, weakest point, right? They, they are not entirely confident in their ability to go through pick spans, whereas Texas A&M, complete opposite. Yeah. They're very confident in, uh, in their options that they have when going through Champion Select, and then the actual calling of it uh, and their late game. So a lot could be riding here on this next pick ban phase before we even get into the game. Yeah. Well, definitely the big question for me is, is that Orianna going to get through again? Because that was just such a huge tool in the previous game. We already talked about how much of an impact he had with those shockwaves. And can they really afford to give them a, an entrance back into the mid game with a pick like Orianna? Yeah, I, I was shocked when they didn't ban the Orianna, right? They ended up banning Ari instead. Um, you know, still a very good pick, right? But doesn't seem as teamfight impacting as Epic Shots likes to be with the Orianna play. So I think looking at the pick and ban is going to be really kind of insightful in showing where the minds of UBC are at, right? Because if UBC is just thinking, we could run it back, we're going to be really strong, and they don't respect the Orianna, they could see the game three, like we're saying. Well, we'll soon find out what these teams have planned in Champions like.